We're going to pivot instead and introduce our amazing developers panel, featuring moderator Carmel Pratt and panelists Kent Gonzalez, Nina Lynch, and Jeff Miro. Welcome, developers. You're up. Welcome, my name is Carmel Pratt. I'm with Bright Power and I'm so excited to have a developers panel here with three amazing folks uh, that are gonna introduce themselves first and then we'll dive into the questions. Hi, I'm Nena Lynch, founder and CEO of Xylem Projects, a mission-driven real estate development firm based in New York City. I'm Kent Gonzalez with Northland Investment Corporation, a um, regional or national owner of apartments, but I focus on the development side. I'm a vice president of development at Northland. I'm Jeff Morell. I'm a principal at Rosenblum Development Corporation, or actually one of the largest fully integrated real estate development and management companies in the capital region of upstate New York. Okay, and now that we've met you all, we're gonna dive right in. Um, and I wanna hear from each of you uh, why you are pursuing Passive House or, or Passive House adjacent um, certifications and standards in your developments. So if you could speak a little bit about um, kind of what um, is incentivizing it, what are the reasons behind the decisions that you're making to pursue what you're pursuing in your developments, um, I'd love to hear, and uh, Nena, if you want to start us out with the New York City landscape. Sure. I mean, I'll just go back to the sort of the origin story of the why, and I think um, what inspired me to pursue uh, Passive House um, is really because we can. Um, and and we, you know, several years ago when I learned about Passive House, um, I really learned about it partly in the context of, you know, Europe was already, you know, pursuing uh, these standards and we're way ahead of us. So that's the first thing, because we can, uh, because we need to, because the real estate industry is a large contributor, greenhouse gases, and uh, because it ultimately um, done well, done right, makes financial sense. And that's both for the owners and operators, but also for the people. Um, I work in the realm of affordable housing and um, every penny you can save, um, you as the operator or that you can pass along to your tenants uh, makes a big difference. Thanks, and Kent, I think, you probably have um, some specific whys to your area in Massachusetts. Yes, our, our path is a little different. It's not quite a benevolent path. We are here because we were dragged into it, kicking and screaming. And um, But I will say that um, as part of the community involvement process of the, in the approvals for our project, the Northland Newton Development, which is a large scale 800 unit, 22 acre project outside of Boston, uh, one of the community groups really wanted us to consider Passive House, and we were pursuing a, a lead centra, central uh, sustainability strategy. We thought that was going to be good enough, but no, uh, this group said we should consider uh, a very influential, we call them the Green Warriors, a really Green Newton, and they're a very influential group in the city of Newton, and uh, we needed to work with them in order to get our project approved and we tried to convince them lead was the way and they wouldn't have anything to do with that. They encouraged us to look at Passive House, which when we didn't want to do Passive House because we didn't want little windows and thick walls. We want a lot of glass in our buildings. And But lo and behold, we engaged a Stephen Winter as our Passive House consultant to teach us uh, and to perform a feasibility study on one of our buildings. And we went from ultimately agreeing to do three buildings as the more and more we learned about past paths we completely embraced it and we have now nine buildings and almost 800 units that'll be completely past pass and we're very proud of it and we are champions of passive house and we've gone from one extreme to the other which is, is really good particularly given what we're trying to do for our the, the environment we try to create for our residents which will still be one of the healthiest environments that any project in boston will have that. Awesome, thank you. And Jeff, um, you're coming to us from a upstate uh, New York mentality and um, you have a somewhat of a unique, um, maybe just a big, just a position between affordable and market rate and um, financial and benevolent and a mix of reasons of why, um, please. 
So uh, I think for us, you know, it's really the same as Nena in the sense that it starts with core values. Um, you know, my partner, Seth Rosenblum, and I believe that we're not just building buildings, we are building a legacy. So, you know, if you consider that buildings produce 45% of New York's energy-related carbon emissions, and it's primarily from burning fossil fuels, gas, oil, propane for heating, cooking, hot water, and other uses, it's really incumbent upon our company and our colleagues in the CRE industry to lower the carbon footprint of our new and existing building stock. Um, you know, I think to that end, we're really property managers who develop real estate. So we take a long operational view. And uh, in addition to being values driven, um, we see upside in building efficiency and resiliency as well as our, you know, customer, client, tenant experience. And um, Jeff, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. What were the um, gateway you know, components, building systems that um, sort of led you to what is now, you know, passive house on, on kind of the extreme whole building um, and more holistic approach. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I think we took uh, definitely more of a component based approach, uh, you know, certainly low hanging fruit like LED conversions, um, you know, we've we've gone deep into renewables, primarily solar. We've deployed about two and a half megawatts to date of our own owned rooftop solar. Um, and but I would say a big trigger point probably was our first new construction multifamily building, a building called the News Apartments in Troy, New York. Um, where we really had the opportunity uh, to uh, take a ground up perspective and start to integrate systems um, and, and not just components. And so that building uh, utilizes geothermal heating and cooling, um, as well as a number of other smart building features. And that was sort of the inception point. Uh, and, you know, as we went through subsequent projects, we sort of began to iterate from that component-driven uh, approach to more of a whole building energy model approach. Great. And Kent, if you could share a little bit about some of the insights you got, um, you know, you, you mentioned hiring a um, consultant, Stephen Winter Associates, to do not only feasibility, but some um, in-house training. So what were the things that um, that started to click or what were some things that you said, well, we're already implementing some of this or halfway implementing some of this and this is how we can take it, you know, all the way? Well, as we learned more about past there were a lot of things that we were not implementing um, that would make our buildings better. And but we learned that it wasn't going to be that hard to implement them. And the value that we got from what those things might be, you no know, thermal breaks, for instance, uh, heavily insulated walls, that how the buildings are going to perform. And again, with the ventilation, how the environment that it creates for our residents, it was like, well, you know, we, need to we need to learn more about it. That's so why when we committed to doing three buildings initially, the more we learned about it, the more we said, well, we've got six other buildings. Why why won't we do it for all of these buildings? And one of the other things that um, we were concerned about is we like to have large windows in our projects, high ceilings and large windows, natural light, there's nothing like it. And that we thought that that, that requirement was going to hinder us from achieving passive house. And it turns out, given the window to wall ratio requirements and limitations under the the base energy code and, and then even with the stretch code here in massachusetts in order to go above those limitations passive house or pathways get higher window to wall ratios in our building so it actually turned out being a benefit for what we were trying to achieve making it easier and then of course the end result is just such a you know a wonderful building now we don't have any under construction yet we're hoping to have one on construction in the fall so we don't uh, but we've you know, got an amazing team putting all of this together. Excellent. And Nana, you spoke about because we can. Um, so, so what what are those things that convinced you that you could? And um, and and maybe you can also talk about some of the things that maybe took a little more convincing. 
Yeah. So what convinced me was really, it was less about components and, and, um, but more about people. Um, there were two architects I had the benefit of meeting. Um, and this is dating back to the early two thousands, um, Laura Briggs and Jonathan Knowles, um, who used to be based in New York. Um, they have a, a company called Briggs Knowles, um, and they're now uh, faculty at RISD and still do, uh, uh, projects. And, um, they were just early adopters and I, I had the good fortune of meeting them. Um, and then they introduced me to the whole community of people that um, at NESI, the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, and that was revelatory going to um, my first conference there. And I met uh, another architect, Chris Benedict, who's based in New York, um, who insists you can do passive house without it costing extra. But what really seduced me was the, um, the simplicity of the concept, right? That, um, that it's not about bells and whistles, because this was also at a time when everybody was saying, well, it's definitely more expensive and it, you need this and you need that. And, and, and most people were focused on the lead approach. And what I found um, so compelling was the simplicity, right? That it's really about doing what you should be doing well anyway, right? Which is creating a really tight building envelope and then making sure that those component uh, parts are high quality. Um, uh, that's really what, what grabbed my attention. So now that we're getting to a point where um, there is less maybe uh, dragging, kicking and streaming and, and, and convincing, um, and and there is um, a more kind of a mainstream um, uptake of, of Passive House, what would you say is the future both personally and for your firm and also that you see in the landscape of um, not only adoption, but of you know, helping helping continue that momentum and helping continue to help other folks make the decision to go passive. And I'll kick this back to you, Ken. Well, in Massachusetts, we're kind of lucky because we've got a pretty forward thinking um, group of folks that have worked together to create the stretch code and the opt-in stretch code. And I think almost all the communities in Massachusetts are, have adopted the stretch code and then the opt-in stretch energy code, which basically requires passive house as a pathway. Um, it's not the absolute, there are other pathways, but they're pretty close to passive house if you don't use passive house. So in some ways it's making the whole process easier and it, you don't even have to think about it. You just really have to figure out how you're gonna make it happen. And there are a lot of people, I mean, it's still, to me, it's, we're still in the infancy stage with this because we're the first market rate project that's going to come online with passive house in the past, at least in Massachusetts, primarily been affordable housing. There's nothing wrong with that, but that, you know, there's, everything's got to comply now, which which is great. And now everybody is working together to try to see what we can do to help, to help people um, get the resources they need to make this easier for them. Um, so it, it's easy for us. I mean, and hopefully that'll, move the rest, the rest of the country. Yes, definitely. Policy and regulation is is the way to go. And I think we're um, a little biased here in, in New York and in Massachusetts where that's already in place. Um, uh, Jeff, maybe you want to speak to um, what other uh, reasons and, and, um, and measures are helping to make these decisions besides policy and regulation? Sure. You know, I mean, again, we too, you know, we're, we're primarily market rate developers and, and that's our approach. You know, I'm going to take a slightly contrary position, which is, you know, for us, what we're finding is that you can't charge more rent for a green building. Uh, we just brought uh, our first multifamily all electric zero emission building online, uh, 80 units uh, in a highly amenitized building in downtown Albany. And certainly we've leaned into the sustainability of the building in our marketing. Um, but uh, you know, it would be very interesting over time as the building stabilizes and leases up, you know, to be uh, dialoguing with our residents to find out, you know, um, was it a factor in selecting the property? Uh, is it maybe a factor in 
renewing at the property and you know what aspects uh, are you aware of uh within this green building and you know what um you know what weren't you necessarily aware of that maybe you became aware of that's changed your mindset so i think understanding the demographics of the marketplace and how people respond to this it's been interesting that uh, what we're finding as as we are talking to residents who are coming in the building um, that you know that's not necessarily been top of mind, but they're really interested in some of the beneficial byproducts of the passive approach to the building design. So you know the continuous filtered fresh air, healthy your apartment units, right? Um, the quieter nature of the building, the better acoustics, you know, our, our residential property management staff likes to sort of like open the door to the balconies and, you know, show the difference uh, when they close it. Um, so I think it's certainly appealing, but like I said, we're not at a point where people are necessarily paying more for that green building. And um, obviously, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, what we're finding is it is more expensive from a first cost perspective to build these buildings right now. And, and over time, that I think will shift um, as we achieve you know, some level of market scale and more experience from the labor side in building these buildings. Um, but so much of what we're doing now isn't just about educating the contractors and, and kind of educating the development construction side of the business, but it's really that dialogue with the the users. And, and I'm speaking strictly about residential tenants, but I think that's across the board, you know, residential, commercial, et cetera. Definitely. And Nana, from the affordable um, perspective, there's also, um, besides policy, there's also incentives out there. Um, definitely not, you know, there, there's rent regulation. So this is not going to change the um, the rent and the, the um, you know, financial outlook on, on that piece. But can you speak a little bit about um, the, the reasons and the decisions, um, both from a tenant perspective and from, from the owner perspective? Yeah, well, I can speak to uh, a project that I'm working on now with Bright Power, in fact, uh, the Carmen Viegas Apartments in, in East Harlem, which is a 28-story tower. It's 100% affordable uh, for seniors. Um, and so if you think back just to the recent past, right, of the, the pandemic and the concerns about air quality and um, and and low income seniors, you know, the idea of really focusing on um, air quality as, as Jeff touched on. But, you know, what I'm I'm most excited about um, is not just this particular project, but the way the conversation about passive house has shifted really even just in the recent past that um, just a few years ago, it was like passive, what? Like, what does that mean? And now what I see, at least in the New York context is, um, and, and by the way, the affordable housing industry is really leading in this regard, is that it's just sort of, it's more and more and just an assumed part of what you do. and. And there is always debate about whether you actually go ahead and certify, but the whole concept of passive house and applying the principles is a no brainer. And every and the architects we work with, um, we see everybody doing it. But, and then it's just this component part that allows you to think more broadly about everything else you want to do. So look, going back to Carmen Viegas apartments that I'm this 28 star story tower in East Harlem that um, we're working on. So yes, we're doing passive house, but we're doing rooftop photovoltaics. We're doing building integrated PVs, you know, we're doing geothermal. And so our overall goal and strategy is to be, you know, net zero. And passive house is, is a facilitating framework to allow that to happen and to think more broadly about sustainability and all of its benefits to, to the world at large, to our community, and then to our residents. Excellent. Yeah. So the future is passive everything, right? It's not passive <laughs> what, I mean, it is passive what, because it's passive anything and, um, and it's beyond the standard. It's applying this, um, this mentality to every approach that you take um, to every building system. Um, and certainly um, I think that there is some catching up to do both on the cost side. Um, and Jeff spoke to, you know, experience helps with that, but also, you know, 
availability of material and, and the market um, certainly has to catch up. Um, and then I think uh, on the other side is um, awareness and demand, right? If if you're not having policy and regulation, are you getting it from your renters? Are you getting it from the tenants, from the community that the that these projects are, are um, getting put up in? So um, a lot to think about there. I think in closing, I'd love uh, for each of you just to quickly share um, what you are most excited about. Um, I, you know, you spoke about projects that you're all working on. What are you most excited about as a developer in this space? And I will kick it back to Kent. Well, for me, I, I'm very focused and maybe I'm, it's not proper, but my project I've been working on since 2014. So I cannot wait after everything that we've been working on and all the commitments that we've made and the really the exciting nature of this being one of the largest all electric passive house um, market rate projects in the country. I just can't wait to get it up and seeing what people, how they react when they come in and start living in these spaces. Um, I mean, it's, it's part of a larger um, village so there's, you know, the all the 10 acres of open space that go with that. But I can't wait to get these buildings up to show people, hey, look what you can do and look what we can do and look what you have an opportunity to live in in these great, really healthy apartments. Uh, that's really, and then obviously to see how this continues to grow throughout, you know, not just Massachusetts, but throughout the country. That's what I'm most excited about. You're here. Nana, what are you most excited about? Yeah, so I sort of a similar response. I've been, you know, participating in conversations about Passive House for a really long time. I talked about, you know, since the early mid 2000s and, um, and you know, I'm finally working on a project that, you know, we hope will close um, in uh, most likely now in, in 2025 um, and to actually, you know, implement it. And um, so just been a huge fan, you know, from a policy standpoint um, and now finally working on a project and then I'm most excited and I hope to I'm, I'm not going to live in this building that I'm that I'm uh developing and by the way i'm developing it with um three partners uh ascendant uh neighborhood um uh development um based in east harlem a nonprofit based in east harlem and urban builders collaborative along with their construction arm lift here um also based in east harlem um but so, and it's a seniors project as i mentioned so i'm not going to be living there but i my hope and dream is to one day myself live in a massive apartment every time i've toured one i'm just sort of blown away by you know Know, the comfort and the quiet, like, you know, the, the, uh, all things that we've we've touched on in this conversation, um, yeah, and to see it continue to proliferate the concepts that so that it's just, um, you know, just a regular part of how we as developers um, do business. Yes, may one day everyone know what it feels like to live in a passive <laughs> house. <laughs> Jeff, what are you most excited about? And you're on mute. Thanks. I think it's the same for us. You know, I think the customer experience is so critical um, to what we do. And um, we actually take kind of a, a, a three-part approach to that. We call it the three Ps, place, practice, and performance. So, you know, we favor adaptive reuse and infill development projects in locations that offer walkability and access to mass transit and shared mobility uh, infrastructure. Um, practice uh, is about empowering tenants to be more sustainable by providing environmentally friendly amenities and uh, services. So a lot of a standard in our building would be indoor bicycle storage and repair, EV charging stations, um, electronics recycling. We offer dual compactors for trash and single stream recycling to make that easier. Um, you know, and we actually work with our local transit authority to provide a universal access pass for all of our residents to get free use of the transit services in the area. Um, and then the third piece is, is the performance piece. That's the piece we're talking about really today, right? Which is, you know, that's sort of integration of the high efficiency building envelope and mechanical systems, incorporating those passive principles, um, bringing in renewable uh, energy sources. Um, and, and so I think the 
to really think uh, what we're excited about is so it's not just you know uh, thinking about sort of the guts of the building, but it is very much how do we tie into a bigger sustainability narrative? Um, how do we work with other providers in our area, um, you know, to uh, introduce our tenants? into a more sustainable lifestyle and you know it so it it starts kind of with the building but it, it expands greatly from there um and you know the idea is we want our residents to become uh green you know evangelists of this greener approach yes certainly beyond beyond the buildings <laughs> um passive everything um, and I'll just say, first of all, thank you so much to, to all of you for taking the time today. And I'm so excited for your buildings to go online. And for us uh, in, in the nerdier side of the, the industry, I'll say to get that data, to get that performance data, to see these buildings being lived in, how they operate, um, and how we can continue to make buildings better from that data. So thank you for, for doing the work, for taking the, um, the leaps to, to develop these these buildings and uh, making these difficult or easy decisions. Um, and thanks for your time again today. Thanks, Carmel. Thank you, Carmel. And Nina and Jeff, amazing discussion and takeaways for both current and aspiring developers, including sharing your hopes and dreams. We all do want to live in one of these buildings. And it's exciting to see the conversation around market rate, affordable and senior housing shift to a narrative that is more like if you're gonna hold it, you're gonna profit. And if you're gonna sell it, you're about to profit from either incentives, lower interest rate, or just the superior luxury experience for the people you build for. So I hope you all along with me are enjoying our three and have taken some lessons to heart for your future work.